The Agenda in the Summer with Nan Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Moving the spotlight from fashion to visibility. I'm Jan Jagannathan, and tonight on the Agenda in the Summer, we catch up with model and disability advocate Rachel Romu for an update in this COVID-19 era. Fashion model Rachel Romu has been bringing visibility to disability one runway at a time. We first caught up with her in 2018. Have a look. They expect me to be in sweatpants and sad all day. Like the society expects me to be in sweatpants and sad all day. There's not a lot of imagery of disabled people being proud, being seen, being visible. I've dried my eyes, now I see. Rachel Romu is a model, an activist, a writer, and musician. The 24-year-old has been turning heads in the fashion industry not just for her height or looks, but for making disability visible on the runway. It's important to me to have it there wherever it fits and wherever it makes sense because that is not all of my self-concept, but it's a huge part of how I navigate this world and how the world views me. She was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder, which requires her to use a cane and walker to get around. But that wasn't always the case for this once promising athlete. I decided to move on to track and field eventually, uh, having tried it in elementary school, because high jump kind of felt like gymnastics for tall people. And it progressed from there where track and field became my main focus of a sport. She was the MVP of her track team four years in a row in Thunder Bay. And in 2010, she represented Canada in the Youth Olympics in Singapore. Sports had always played a big role in her life, even into university. I was at track practice one day and I was in the weight room and it was a very easy day. And I was training with my coach and I was training one-on-one because -on -one I was not very experienced with weightlifting in particular. And nothing actually went wrong that day. But it was the next morning that I couldn't sit up out of bed without one of my legs going numb, that I figured something was seriously wrong. So I went and saw my team doctor, and uh, my team doctor unfortunately didn't take me all that seriously and basically said, don't sit down for two weeks and you'll be fine. She ended up tearing two discs in her lower back, which later led to the discovery of a tumor near her spinal cord. In 2014, she had surgery to remove it, but things only got worse from there. My left arm was going numb a lot and I was dropping things in my house. So at that point I knew it was more complicated than I was originally willing to accept. Take this many Tylenol every day for like the last two years. So this is just my... For more than a year, she urged her doctors to look into her pain further. She wasn't able to work and was forced to drop out of school. And I've never felt so betrayed by people I'm asking for help for, who it's their obligation to help, but also by my own body, because as my reality is being denied, I'm looking at my body like, why, wow, you shouldn't hurt, like, geez, like, are you crazy? Like, what, what's going on with you, Rachel? Like, what's wrong with you? Like, they're saying nothing's wrong, but why is my body, why can't I get out of bed this morning? It was just this really unnerving experience on so many levels. Rachel needed a second surgery. All eight of the screws from her first one had fallen out. Four of her vertebrae were fractured. And in 2016, she was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It is a connective tissue disease that disrupts your collagen production. It affects my circulatory system where I have some dysautonomic style heart racy dysfunction where going from laying just to sitting up, my heart will almost double. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome also affects her joints, which, like her hands, suffer from frequent dislocation. Any chance she had of a career in track and field was over, so Rachel had to reinvent herself. She pursued modeling in hopes that she could dispel misconceptions of disability created by people like Kylie Jenner, 
an able-bodied reality TV star who appeared on the cover of Interview magazine in a wheelchair. And I felt so alienated by all these false images of disability, all these able-bodied people putting on a mobility device like it's a prop or a costume that could like take off at the end of the day when I couldn't take my disability off at the end of the day. She has a really nice look. She has a little bit of like an alien vibe to her, which I really love. And then also she's just such a genuinely nice person herself. Haley L. Cesar is a Toronto-based fashion designer and is known for having diverse models on her runway. When I cast for my shows, it's half about how um, a person fits the clothing and how they look and the general vibe that they have if they have like something interesting about how they look, but also about the person themselves. This past summer, Rachel got her chance to walk in Toronto's fashion week. She was the only model with a visible disability. Haley was the only designer to be open to see me. And I didn't expect anybody would be open to see me, but I thought that they would, you know, like let me come through and say like, hi, okay, like nice to meet you and still like not book me. But Haley was the only designer to like directly reach out to me being like, hi, I'm having a casting. I would love for you to be there. I remember getting off of the runway and I was so grateful I only had one look that day because it wasn't necessarily the fact that I walked on a runway, I'd done that a number of times before, but just knowing what the event meant and knowing that I kind of felt like I wasn't supposed to be there, but somehow still was and felt like I challenged people and changed their minds and I saw people like clapping and it was just very overwhelming. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm so thankful to have been able to bring that kind of visibility to disability. In general, fashion is very exclusive, which I hate. And in the past, I kind of felt like an outsider. I've never been someone who's been, I've always been someone a little bit bigger and I have tattoos and colorful hair. So I've never really fit into the mold of the typical fashion person. So I can kind of understand not feeling like you belong. Every time I hear that camera click, I think this is another photo that puts more disability visibility in the world. I can't forget this now. That was then. Have things moved forward since? And what role does this pandemic play in the lives of people with disabilities? We're pleased to check in with Rachel Romu, who joins us this evening from Thunder Bay. Welcome to the show. Pleasure to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, let's uh, pick up kind of where we uh, left off. How has life been since uh, that video aired on TVO in 2018? Life has been so wild. It's almost like that video sort of showed my capabilities to like a whole different set of people. And it almost like accelerated my career in certain ways. And it's been incredible to find myself not only in new spaces in fashion, but also in new spaces as a musician as well. I got to play North by Northeast, Pride, and uh, a sold out show at the Horseshoe Tavern in September of uh, 2019. I want to talk about uh, your music as well because, you know, a lot of it is super emotional. A lot of the lyrics you write, you know, we were, there's, you know, there's this shot that I have in that video where you're writing kind of the lyrics down. These are, you know, these are very important lyrics to you and music to you. Talk to us about kind of the process and where do you kind of see yourself uh, as a musician? As a songwriter, I've tried to focus on sort of a little bit of self-care with some of the things I've gone through and uh, disabled women are like disproportionately uh, at risk of experiencing domestic violence and abuse because of the way in which uh, we are occasionally dependent on others, the way in which ODSP is structured where we lose a lot of support as soon as we end up in a common law or marriage type partnership. So I wanted to speak to that in a lot of my writing and speak to that honestly, and as well as just some of the positive and uh, more joyful experiences as well. But it's just about being as truthful as I can be about what it's like moving through the world with this body. Now, I want to talk about um, kind of your, your modeling. Um, <clears throat> obviously, things have slowed down significantly with COVID-19, but uh, what was your last modeling project before uh, things kind of shut down? 
Yes, things have slowed down for sure. But my last uh, proper shoot was in February and it was uh, creative that ended up uh, finding a home in the summer 400 page edition of La Ficielle. So I'm really excited about that because it's sort of the first time I'm in a magazine, not purely about my advocacy, but just for being really good at my job. And it's incredible to have this huge, huge, huge uh, moment of breakthrough success in, you know, the years that have come. Do you find that's a challenge that, you know, people um, look at you for someone who is an advocate um, as, you know, a disability advocate, and that's essentially why you feel maybe sometimes you get the work you do? Or is this kind of the case where, hey, I am good at what I do? It's complicated because a lot of the places that I've been magazine wise have like featured me as an advocate, but have yet to feature me as like a model. And that's part of why I'm an advocate is a, it's about the employment equity aspect of things where I talk about how accommodating for disabled people means, you know, we can do a really good job at our tasks, but I haven't always been able to go from interview subject to mm -hmm. model in the magazine yet, but this was a big step towards that. I want to talk about uh, Toronto Fashion Week. Um, it had a huge impact on your career, but earlier this year, uh, it was announced that this year's show would be canceled. Now, for reasons unrelated to COVID-19, um, how did you take that news initially when it, uh, when it was announced in January? I was heartbroken when Toronto Fashion Week uh, was announced to be canceled because it not only broke my career, but many of the people I've gotten to work with as designers and other models and all the behind the scenes people have become friends as well. And they're all of a sudden out of a work opportunity or a place to showcase their designs. And I believe that there was definitely some uh, issues with the infrastructure of the Canadian fashion industry. We have some incredible designers that have yet to be recognized on a world stage. And with Fashion Week canceled, it makes it almost more difficult for designers, models, and even event producers to break out of Toronto and have the opportunity to do the extraordinary things they are totally capable of. I want to uh, pull back the curtain a little bit because, you know, you kind of get that glimpse of um, the kind of the Canadian fashion industry. Um, what are the challenges um, or what do you think are the challenges that the industry faces um, in terms of, you know, Toronto Fashion Week versus Paris, Milan and, and so forth? In my opinion, some of the Toronto Fashion Week focal points aren't necessarily the designers that happen to be ending up in large department stores. And there's a little bit of a sense of traditionalism, which it's important to honor like the fashion that we have known and grown from. But at the same time, I wasn't seeing uh, the same amount of shine put on some designers that were doing more different things, whether it was a streetwear collection with a social political theme, or even just uh, trying a different cut or experimenting with uh, having people of different body types and gender identities all over the runway. It was always kind of not accepted as wholeheartedly as I had hoped. Now, um, when we were talking earlier this year, you had mentioned uh, possible plans of working in the U.S. This was before the pandemic, of course. Uh, where does that stand and what was kind of the allure? The allure to working in the U.S. was that all the big brands that have amazing e-commerce contracts that are inclusive, especially to people with disabilities, exist there. Most of that work was in the United States. However, you need to have an O-1 visa to be able to work in the States in this role. And the criteria is earning about $30,000 in the industry or having an exceptionally rare talent, which is why some of the press about disability advocacy was important. However, the US is currently looking a lot more like a nightmare. And also I imagine the visa process is more stringent and reject rejected than usual. I'm curious, you had talked about kind of some of the some of the retailers that, you know, may not make it past this pandemic. Uh, you've been slowly looking at gigs and already things are kind of changing in that aspect. But what do you see this looks like after? I suspect that malls as we know it will not exist. 
I suspect that our purchasing habits that we currently have as consumers in North America will drastically change due to an economic crisis. And I suspect that a lot of uh, fashion that is more financially accessible to folks maybe perhaps won't be as readily available. It's a big question mark. I am curious about uh, kind of the, the gigs that you're looking at and, and booking. Uh, talk to me a little bit about um, what's on the horizon and uh, kind of how your agency and how the industry is kind of adapting right now to it all. My agents, Plutino Models and Peggy LaPage are amazing. They've been so accommodating and advocating for their models, not just me with vulnerable health, but everybody that they send to a job on set for proper sanitization and PPE. I have a shoot coming up for a magazine and I'm really excited about it. It's actually including an adaptive clothing line. So it's the first time a disability centric clothing line is something that I get to do in a magazine style shoot. Mind you, I'm a little bit terrified because I want to make sure that I myself don't get sick, but also don't make anyone in my community unwell as well. So I'm basically going to hand sanitize up to my elbows. Now, I understand, you know, in terms of the, the modeling industry, a lot of this is casting calls, uh, models coming in, doing their walks. Um, you know, there's a lot of high traffic. How, how has the industry kind of changed that? Are you guys doing everything virtually or...? For the most part, the casting process is entirely digital now, which I kind of love to a degree, but it's important to have a working and good cell phone. So that's a, a feature that's uh, made it, I guess, a little bit more accessible and a little bit more flexible on most people's schedules because you can kind of take your digitals or film your casting segment anytime throughout the day. Now, I want to ask, obviously, um, in the piece that we aired earlier, we talked about EDS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, how are you doing? You look well. Um, how have you been feeling um, with, uh, with that condition? I've been feeling a lot better um, compared to the time in which we met. Mind you, it's because I sort of unlocked a few other facets of EDS. I was having some additional issues that I saw an immunologist for some mast cell stuff and uh, celiac things. So now that I'm absorbing food properly, I can really, really take on the world at a different capacity because I have energy that I didn't know I was supposed to have. I am curious, you know, for someone with a disability, what's, how has coping been during this pandemic? A global health crisis has definitely brought back some horrifying memories of a personal health crisis. Mm -hmm. So I've been experiencing, I guess, what everyone else is, plus my own baggage at the same time. But I think some of the experiences I've already had just with my own health have led me to be unfazed by staying home and isolating and working from home because that was my life for many years prior to this. Have you had people reach out, friends and stuff, and, and kind of expressed how, you know, frustrated they were with, you know, being cooped up at home and not being able to go out and kind of having to tell them, like, hey, this is kind of my reality for the past couple of years? Yeah, there's been a lot of conversations where I've literally just said, welcome to the club. Mind you, for the last year, I've actually been a lot more out and about just because my health was sort of getting better. But it's sort of uh, provided a window into abled people's uh, psyche where they can sort of see where disabled people have been living and uh, socially ex interacting for this entire time. Now, the federal government um, has been praised by some for the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, also known as CERB, um, as a response to loss of income for Canadians, but it doesn't deliver for all, particularly those with disabilities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know you've been advocating for that, uh, for a change in that. Tell me um, kind of what you kind of first saw when CERB was out there. I know um, you're also on ODSP as well, so you, you know, you, seeing that kind of difference in change. Uh, for our viewers, let me, I wanna make sure I get the numbers right. For CERB, you of, of course get $2,000 if for someone who's on ODSP, you get just under $1,200, correct? So, yeah, and you only get just under $1,200 if you're able to work and get the bonus $100. But to me, it's absolutely disgusting that somebody sat and made a calculation that the basic needs requirement across Canada was approximately $2,000. And that's for working class people that may have savings, that may have a rainy day fund, that may be homeowners, that may have more flexible housing needs because of their 
accessibility needs not being something that disabled people have to interface with. So it's been really tough to digest for many people on ODSP that the numbers are we need $2,000 to survive, but we have never, ever, ever been given the number that is the necessary amount to survive. If ODSP was designed for us to live, then perhaps we would actually have that number met. I want to quickly ask you, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a big question, but if there was one thing that you could see um, change uh, that comes out of this pandemic, what would it be? I'm seeing a lot of people who were too busy and burnt out to be politically active really stepping up, and that's supporting many issues regarding social justice, community safety. <laughs> and I think that that's incredible. I feel like we will have a more active community working with our members of parliament, our uh, federal, provincial, and even our local governments demanding changes that support our communities, keep us alive and thriving. Rachel, it's a pleasure to have you on the show again. It's always great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Addiction doesn't take a break just because there's a pandemic. In fact, the situation may be getting worse. Nick Dunn is our Ontario Hubs journalist covering the Northeast. He joins us now from Sudbury for more on the opioid crisis during COVID-19. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thanks for having me, Jan. Now, we've been really focused on COVID-19, but uh, a lot of people have probably forgotten that there is still an ongoing crisis with opioids. And I thought we would start off before we get into your article about why opioids are so lethal. Well, opioids are a uh, synthetic derivative of opiates. So, you know, opiates like uh, heroin mm -hmm. or codeine, uh, these are naturally derived. Um, opioids, on the other hand, are synthetically made and can be up to 50 to 100 times more powerful uh, than morphine. At least that's uh, the potency of fentanyl, the most common one you find on the street. And uh, not only that, but, uh, you know, substances like fentanyl are being uh, cut and used in things that aren't necessarily opiates or opioids. You know, you see it in your stimulants, your your cocaine, your methamphetamines. Um, so you know, you're you know, you're seeing higher levels of addiction uh, because you know it's in these other substances. So you might not be taking opioids, but you might have a fatal level of opioids in that substance. Now, in your reporting, you talked about uh, how there. are opioid overdoses and deaths have actually increased during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Talk to us about uh, the contributing factors in that. Yeah, so first I'll just go over the numbers really mm. quickly. Uh, the median number of uh, suspected drug overdose deaths per week in 2019 was about 44 people per week, which is significant. Um, since the onset of uh, the opioid overdose, uh, we've seen every week having above that level of the median. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, over 44 people. And nine of those first 15 weeks have seen a statistically significant uh, increase. So we're looking at an increase of over 25%. So we're looking at upwards of 55 deaths per week in quite a few weeks since uh, the COVID-19 crisis began. Um, in terms of the causes, I mean, the opioid crisis is tied inherently to the hip uh, with so many different social issues. So everything from joblessness, uh, housing, uh, you know, the interruption of your daily routine, things being closed, the, you know, the library, which uh, I had written about uh, on TVO.org, um, the shortage of food at food banks, which our colleague Charnel Anderson had written mm -hmm. about on TVO.org, and even hidden homelessness being exposed, people not necessarily wanting uh, folks in their apartment when they're trying to keep socially distanced, which uh, our colleague Mary Baxter had written about. So there are so many different factors that go into why we're seeing this increase. But, um, you know, we're looking at housing, uh, homelessness, and just general life stress. Now, I understand you went out with the Sudbury Action Center for Youth um, when they were doing kind of a walk uh, through the downtown. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I went on a needle pickup tour with Joel Boivin. He is a uh, harm reduction worker at SASE. Um, you know, we went along the streets. We picked up uh, needles, uh, you know, where they're commonly found. He's kind of figured out where some of the uh, common drop-off spots are. And, uh, you know, they're saying that they're seeing increased numbers. They're seeing it bloom outwards around Sudbury. So they're seeing, you know, a real... Um, increase in uh, those pickups. Um, you know, he was talking to me about how this is a 
crisis of suffering, not necessarily of uh, addiction, although addiction is certainly uh, the heart of the matter here. Um, but, you know, when suffering goes up, when, you know, people are homeless, when people are hungry, they're exposed to the heat outdoors, um, you know, we're seeing more activity and we're seeing more hardship out there on the street. Now, obviously, talking with the Sudbury Action Center for Youth, um, have we talked about any kind of solutions? Well, um, you know, if there were easy solutions to this, JN, I'd think, uh, you know, we wouldn't be where we're at. You know, I think everyone I spoke to from the coroner's office to public health to law enforcement and harm reduction, they all say that there's no simple solution here. You know, um, I mean, we're seeing progress with uh, the National Association of Chiefs of Police um, advocating for the decriminalization of possession. Uh, in Ottawa, there is a, you know, the, the, the city council had uh, advocated for a um, safe supply pilot that had uh, worked quite well in Ottawa. Even the former chief of police, um, Vern White, had advocated for it. Um, so we're seeing, you know, definitely raised attentions to this, uh, even with uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry, the chief medical officer in uh, BC. But, um, you know, I think the number one thing we have to think about here is stigma. Um, you know, getting to those reasons why people use drugs um, and having, you know, a frank conversation collectively about uh, you know, how we're going to do this. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that if there's significant political will, you know, we can create large uh, changes very quickly to address health concerns. I mean, uh, COVID and opioids are two very different beasts, if you will. But, um, you know, we're, we're seeing, you, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very complicated solution. It's very mm -hmm. deeply tied to, uh, you know, our society and uh, various problems in society. But, um, until we have those conversations, we're not going to see, uh, you know, proactive or comprehensive solutions. It's only going to be piecemeal, which is kind of why we've seen these increases in opioid overdoses since this thing began five, six years ago. Nick, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Of course, an important story uh, that you've, you know, you have highlighted that we have covered on TBO.org in the past, and we will continue. Thank you again, Nick. That's Nick Dunn, our Ontario Hubs journalist covering northeastern Ontario. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I am Jan Jagnathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend, and Nam will see you again on Monday. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.